Good evening, everyone, or good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're from. Uh, this is Pete Pardo from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prog Seat. It's Tuesday night. We've got in the house tonight, we've got uh, Lewis Nasser from Chicago, wearing the shirt of my favorite band of all time. We've got George <laughs> Lemie <laughs> from Chicago. We got Ken Golden from the Lasers Edge Century Records from New Jersey. We've got Anthony Ferraro from Pennsylvania. We've got Chuck Alvarez, my fellow New Yorker from the Bronx, and all the way from Scotland, Mr. Stephen Reed. Good evening, everybody, or good greetings this morning, like I already said. Uh, mm -hmm. Tonight, we have arrived at 1974, so uh, a really, really, really great year for prog rock and fusion. I've asked everybody to pick out their five favorite albums from 1974, prog rock or fusion, and uh, as we were talking before we went live here, uh, a ridiculous year with like a million great releases. So uh, I have this feeling we might see some similar picks today, but I think we're going to get a good cross section of all the greatness that was 1974. So we're going to go, we're going to start with, uh, geez, all right, we're going to start with Steve. We're going to go Stephen, Ken, Anthony, Chuck, George, Lewis and myself, and then keep going round and round till we get to our number one. So, Stephen, kick us off with your number five. Okay, my number five is, and I've only just realized nobody cares, but I'm just in from my first post lockdown gig, so I might not be quite as organized as I thought it was. So, my number five would appear not to be here, however, it is The Power and the Glory, Gentle Giant. That's where I'm starting that with my. I knew somebody would. Thank you very much, Peter. I mean, to be fair, I mean, I knew, you know better than I knew that. You <laughs> I, knew that, I knew you would have it there. Yeah, I mean, as you've said, there was two ways of looking at this. Um, find the obscure things, try and go a bit off-piste, be a bit different. But, it, I mean, 74 is too good. I just picked five albums that I really like. So it might be that everybody else's. They might not. So, yeah, I really love this album. I mean, the top five... My top five here easily could all be number one. And in different years, they would be number one. That's the kind of standard we're at. Every band seems to be at the top of their game. And it's just ridiculously good. So, yeah, the, the power and the glory. Do you know, I listened to this again today. Probably why I can't find it now. Um, I don't know if there's another band that could make things that were so ridiculously complex just sound so natural. Mm -hmm. so, you know, that, that's the real trick of Gentle Giant, especially at this phase. It just seemed that the arrangement could be mad and crazy. And you listen to it and you think it's just so natural, so unforced. And, and that's the beauty of, 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 well, Gentle Giant in general, but definitely this album. I mean, you go from proclamation, so sincere, and then you go into aspirations, which just, it's almost like a palate cleanser. It feels simple and restrained compared to what's come before, but it's really not. It's, it's a remarkable journey across that album. Cogs and cogs, I mean, the arrangements there are just, they're so busy, but it's not cluttered. Nothing feels like it's there for the, for the sake of it. They never show off. Gentle Giant never show off. It's not just, whoa, look what we can do. It's always about the song. The songs tend to be quite short. It's, it's a fantastic album. I mean, you've got the face. Mm -hmm. It's driven. It's dark. It is uncompromising. And the interplay between everybody in the band and that song is just amazing. I mean, this is my number five, and I could talk about this album all night, so I'll stop there. My, my number five is The Power and the Glory, Gentle Giant. Maybe my favourite Gentle Giant album. Yeah, I mean that'll change tomorrow, but it's it's outstandingly good. It's your hey, were we tennis. were we just having that discussion on Facebook today? Holy yes, cow, yes. <laughs> on my page, yeah. <laughs> right, it's your favorite Gentle Giant album of 1974. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Good one. laughs> and I do want to mention, Stephen literally just got home from going to see the Wild Hearts tonight. So, of oh, course, he's cool. five hours ahead of us. So yep. it's the end of the evening. The show's, I mean, I'm amazed you made it back uh, right on time. I was like, not too bad. Yeah, it wasn't as far away. You guys are usually in Glasgow. It's Glasgow, Peter. I don't care. Oh, not in Glasgow? People. Not Glasgow, No. <laughs> um, I was in Stirling tonight, which is not the rock and roll capital of not even Scotland. Um, it was a great gig. They were fantastic. Uh, the room was too big because it was upgraded quite late on. So there's a strange dynamic. But 
as my first gig in I don't know how long, it, it was pretty fantastic. But yes, I'm literally, I've walked in the house, sat down, and you hit record. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I have my first one on Sunday. I'm going to ZZ Top on Sunday, so. Oh. He's playing bass with ZZ Top. Their guitar tech wearing a, a fake beard. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wearing a fake beard. Oh, was it? Was Actually it, was wearing it, a fake beard. Why? <laughs> At least that's what he was a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if he's still Gosh. wearing a beard or not. I don't know. Yeah. Pete, was it intentional that the only guy in ZZ Top that didn't wear a beard was Frank Beard? Yes. Yeah, he just never grew a beard. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that was, I, yeah. He, he said that he could, it, it would never look good if he grew it out. <laughs> that was his, that was his thing. It would get in the way of his drumming, I guess, you know. Just going to say the sticks. It's, it's actually <laughs> funny that the guys go Frank Beard didn't have the beard. The I know, guys. right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's I like it's irony in rock and roll, right? <laughs> All right. So we got uh, General Janet, number five for Stephen. Uh, Ken, you're up. So 74 was a, pretty much a watershed year, I think, for progressive music. Yep. 73, 74, I mean, there's just too many things that we could pick as the best. And, you know, we could probably all pick the same albums, but there's just so much to pick from. So I'm going to kind of do what I usually do and pick the less obvious things. Uh, and I'm happy if other people pick the, the more famous stuff because those are my favorites too. So uh, my number five <clears throat> is from Denmark. Secret Oyster. Yes. Ooh, good Seaside. choice. Yeah. <laughs> so Secret Oyster, they were a Danish band. Seasun was their second album. Uh, the band consisted of members of Burning Red Ivanhoe and Hurdy Gurdy. They were they were basically Denmark's answer to Nucleus with maybe a little dash of Mahavishnu Orchestra thrown in there. It's very high energy jazz rock with just this incredible psychedelic guitar playing from Klaus Bowling. He was the guitarist in Hurdy Gurdy and he's just a monster. Uh, the musicianship overall is fantastic. All the members other than Bowling really came from the, from the Danish jazz scene. Yeah, Carson Vogel on on sax kenneth knudsen on piano uh, and after secret oyster those guys kind of went off back into the jazz world but the soloing is fantastic there's a lot of unison lines sometimes it gets difficult to tell who's playing what i mean they're just it's very intricate music but it, i mean the thing really really rocks a lot of people think their next album is their best album and straight to the cranking house and that might be their best album but since we're doing 1974 this is this is the album and it, it really is fantastic i reissued all the secret oyster albums and we put uh, we we uh found some unreleased tracks and when we did the cd we threw a few bonus tracks on there which were you know equally good but do you have any plans yeah. for printing anymore no no, actually, they just, you know, my license ran out. I have all mine. And uh, Long Hair Music in Germany, or France, uh, reissued all of them. And basically, they copied them right off of my CD. So, and they well, did. I can't buy them from you anymore. I have to buy from this Frenchie. No, you can. We, well, you can't buy my versions. You can buy the Long Hair version. We have those in stock. Okay. We should, we, or we should, you know. If not, we restock them all the time. All right, well. Secret, okay. Secret Oyster, they were... They, they were a band that I think they should have been bigger than they were. You know, their yeah. albums were released in different countries, but they never like came over here and toured. Uh, but they could have easily, you know, ridden the coattails of a band like Mahavishnu or Return to Forever. But uh, yeah, that's my number they played five. They played the Nearfest though, right? They played Nearfest. Yeah. I, I saw them there. I saw them at Orion. <laughs> They were just incredible at Orion. Yeah, yes. uh, Bowling is just such an amazing guitar player. He was just, uh, I mean, that was like a face melting show. Uh, I think they also, I think they also played a prog band. So, but yeah, the, the little yeah. yeah. That's what so, so Lewis, we're we're gonna we're gonna spoil Ken here because I think like after every episode, one of us or more or some of us on the staff get off the call and go onto the Laser's Edge website and place an order. I did it last week, right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> you did. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, I've been wanting to buy those from you for a while, but you, you, you didn't have them. So I'm just, I'm just putting you on the air. Well, 
you know, uh, Luis, for you, I'll, maybe for the other guys too, I'll, uh, I'll look in the, the archives and I'll see if I, if I have something squirreled away. All right. There you go. But, yeah. Th those are, if you like jazz rock fusion, those albums are essential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Cool. All right. Our center square, Anthony, who I think uh, has a big surprise for us tonight. That's uh -oh. I guess. Um, <laughs> all right. My number five from 1974, uh, Gong is one and one is you from 1974, okay. the uh, finale of the uh, trilogy featuring Steve Hillage, David Allen, uh, Tim Blake. Uh, some of my favorite tracks are Sprinkling in Clouds uh, featuring Tim Blake. Uh, it's very psyche, very space rock. Uh, very lauded by many Gong fans as the masterpiece of the trilogy and of their discography. So it's one of my favorites, and it's one of my favorites from 1974. So Gong You from 1974. Nice. I, I only just bought that recently. I, I never had any of the trilogy albums. I just bought them. Oh wow! I'm surprised yeah. by that. And so that was on my long. That was on my long list. Yeah, it's good mm -hmm. stuff. I like it. Very yeah. cool. Good choice. I think that's the best one of the trilogy, bro. Uh, yeah, it might be, right? I don't know. I don't know well enough. It's the yet. most accessible. Yeah. The most accessible. You know, right. Yeah, I've been really digging Shamal quite a bit. That's also oh, right here. That came right nice. after, but yeah. That's, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a transition. You know? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Good deal. Strong. All right, Chuck. All right. My number five is going to, another curveball um, is um, Funkadelics, Standing on the Verge of um, Getting It On. Standing on the verge of getting it on, to get it, <laughs> get it on. on. exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know this album right here. You know, funk. There's a big difference between funkadelic and Parliament, especially during this time. You know, Parliament rocked. You know, they were like, they they rocked like a progressive rock band, like a like a metal band at times or so. And you know, they also had their psychedelia with their with their R and B um type of um style and so, but. This album right here, man, if you haven't heard this album, man, everything on here is just just absolutely fantastic, man. Red Hot Mama has been covered by one of my least favorite bands of all time, Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> oh, you don't like the Chili Peppers? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but once again, this album right here, uh, Funkadelics, um, Standing on the Verge of Getting It On, 1974. <laughs> that's a really cool cover. <laughs> it, it, it really is. Great is, artwork yeah. on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's a rocking album, man. It's, it's it really all is, the Westbound, man. all the Westbound albums are great. Yep. Mm -hmm. Maggot Brain is my favorite. Yep. Oh, yeah, Maggot, oh, Brain. Maggot Brain is awesome, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I must admit, I, I bought some Funkadelic albums when I was quite young. Man oh man, I did not understand them. <laughs> <laughs> didn't get it at all. Hindsight, I was wrong. They were right. But back then, I was like, what have I done? <laughs> I, I can see Steve, Steve going home and showing his mom, hey, look, I just picked up, I just picked up free your mind, your ass will follow. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite song. <laughs> Good song. Mm -hmm. Fine. Uh, <laughs> all right, George, what do you got for us? Number five. My number five. <coughs> oh, tilt. Boom. Boom. Yeah. Yes, indeedy. Tilt. It's a six piece band from Italy. Uh, some call them Prague, some call them Fusion, because it is a couple vocal tunes. Uh, for me, you can't break this up into songs. It, it feels like it was written as one big piece. It's indexed and it's got titles, but I find the, the transitions to be fairly abrupt. Either that or blended in so well that they didn't need to put one in there. But uh, uh, the violin player is really strong, but the band is most noted for drummer Furio Chirico, whose <laughs> left hand is just spastic in the best way. He's a guy, the guy is all over that snare drum. Um, they, they put out other good albums after this, but no, they never matched this to me. So if you want to hear uh, a balls out drummer, this is the one. <clears throat> Has a lot of uh, Tony Willem influences on him. That's a great album. He's mm -hmm. good. He's Tony Williams on yeah. I mean, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the Italy scene had a lot of great drummers, a lot of great musicians, but their drummers were off the hook, man. The drummer for Le Orm. The drummer for um, Banco, you know, these guys were just great drummers, man. Yeah. And that guy, that album is pretty good, man. It's a recommended album. 
I like it. I got the boot from they played Prague Day in the 2000s. Did anybody see that? It sounded, it sounded good. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I like that one a lot. <clears throat> good choice. Mm -hmm. All right, Lewis. Well, I'm going to have to to repeat one record, but this is undeniable. I'm going to go with The Power and the Glory. Nice. And in particular, um, it, there, the, the Gentle Giants organized this thing called the, the Gorg. And there was a year when the Gorg was done in Chicago. So essentially, all these Gentle Giant fans converge and members from the band show up oh, and there's a concert. And... Um, and Mike Hood was invited to perform at that thing. So we went and I, I got to convince the guys in Mike Hood that it would be great to do an arrangement of one of our songs, which is called Machinery, with Cogs and Cogs. Oh, nice. And call it Cogs and Machinery. Now, the, the full disclaimer is the guys in, in, in Mike Hood had never heard Gentle Giant. And they had no idea what the hell this was. And I just said, well, look, here's, here's the sheet music. Just learn your part, right? Mm -hmm. I just broke it down and, and we, we made this thing. And um, what I did had not anticipated was that we would be playing it in front of Carrie and those guys, right? Wow. <laughs> so that was a little, you know, I'm not normally shy when I go on stage or anywhere, really. I don't really give a shit. But that was a little intimidating <laughs> to me. Of course, the guys in the band couldn't care less because to them, it's just some old English guy, right? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But it went across well, and it, it was a really nice moment. You know, the, the next day over breakfast, like uh, Carrie and his wife came over and congratulated me on, on the fact that we didn't just do a cover; we did mm -hmm. a nice arrangement. So this one in particular, when it, when you when you, the nineteen seventy four came up, it had to be. I just love it, and it has a, now it has a sentimental value in addition, right? So nice, just giant Ooh, nice. power and the glory. Nice. <laughs> well. Gentle Giant, Power and the Glory is my number five as well. Uh, you know, I, I really struggle with where to put these in my top five because uh, I, I don't remember. I think Stephen might have said it. Any of my top five could be my number one. Uh, my honorable mentions could have been my number one. I mean, I, it's, that's how strong this year was. But, man, this is a powerhouse album. Uh, like I mentioned earlier at the top of the show, uh, we were kind of uh, a bunch of us were communicating on Facebook today about uh, In a Glass House. And I think, uh, you know, Lewis said that was his favorite gentle giant. Anthony, I don't remember, or was it Chuck? I don't remember who started. Mine, right? That's mine. Yeah. And I, I chimed in. It's like there are days where In a Glass House is my favorite. There are other days where it's Octopus or Three Friends or Freehand. Some days it might be this one. You know, I mean, they have like all those albums in a row. They're just absolutely classic. And, you know, Steven said it perfectly. It, this music is so crazy complex but yet it's so listenable it's wacky and zany but it makes all perfect sense and uh just one of the most unique bands ever i think and uh, a lot of their you know great great classic tunes are on here cogs and cogs playing the game proclamation so sincere i mean you know basically the whole album is just the whole fantastic. entire album no. it is it's top to bottom and uh you know this is the uh the Stephen Wilson uh, remix here that came out a couple of years ago, which is damn good. So yeah, uh, nice. that's my number five. I also awesome. think Ray Showman is very underrated as a bass player. Oh, he's he's, he's fantastic, an incredible bass player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. He's a big hero of mine. I mm -hmm. I love his playing. Did any of you get to see him play live? Channel Giant? No. no. Nope. Too young. Sadly. I saw him seventy-seven. I saw him seventy-seven. Played a fool. Played him. Doctor Feelgood opened up. Oh, got booted, that... They got booed off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> they got pelted. They, they, they played two songs. They got about halfway through Wind Up Doll, and they, got, and they walked off. You just play because I like Doctor Feel uh, Doctor Feel Good, but they weren't. That was you know, not a good. Not a good that was not a good nope. pairing. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Told them they had his gentle giant opening up for Sabbath. And yeah, yeah that's bad. Yeah, that's bad. <laughs> You're a bunch of fucking cunts. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not when, when I had the, when I had Rick on the show and he was telling that story, he told every, every every everything that was said. He just blurted it right out. I was like, "Whoa!" Hearing it right from the source, you know. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, uh, back down to Stephen once again for number number four. So as I say, I've gone I've gone pretty straight down the line with this. I'm not beating off path, and I'll I'll take the hit for love it or loathe it. This is, this is Love It or Loathe It. 
It's love it or uh, love it. Do you favorite know? album of all time. There you go. People either love it or they loathe it. And that's all <laughs> the way with a long life down on Broadway. Uh, to me, I, I, well, I love it. It's clear that I love it. As I say, 74 is crazy good. And it just had to be in here. I mean, the title track's phenomenal. It's got carpet crawlers. But the thing for me is you go deeper on this album and talk about the tracks that have been forgotten about. In the Cage, back in NYC, the Chamber of 32 Doors, all the longer pieces, not, not so much, some of the joining pieces are fantastic too, but the longer pieces are just so underrated. I mean, the band are on fire here. It's interesting because I listened to both this and The Gentle Giant today, trying to work out orders and not that it really matters, but really trying to be quite careful about what went where. Gentle Giant make it sound really easy. And it's interesting because Genesis don't in the same way. It's quite structured and, you know, placement's really important. And it's a completely different way of coming out away with a, a, not a similar progressive album, they're remarkably different in actual fact. But they're, they're in the same pot, they're the same genre. But the way that these albums must have been created is completely different, you know? And I think that Banks is fantastic on this album. Oh, yeah. He's so often an overlooked part of Genesis, but on he, he seems to just be allowed to be a little crazy and a little zany. And it, it is maybe not quirkier than Genesis are because there's lots of quirks in Genesis, but it's a different type of quirk on the lamb. And I think that's why maybe some of the really hardened fans find this just a little too standoffish for them, do you know? But then you look at even, I mean, I mean some of the drumming from, from Phil Collins oh. is... <sighs> yeah, actually, I always, with that album, I always felt that the secret um, ingredient on that album was Mike Rutherford. The, mm -hmm. What he does on that album, you know, his 12 string and his bass playing is just off the chain on that album. Yeah. You know, the band was on fire, but really it was Mike Rutherford, man. Great album. My yeah. favorite album of all time, man. There's a lot of subtlety on that album. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things you have to really, you just you can't just take it on the surface. You really have to listen to it. You know, I, yeah. The only thing I don't like about it is that I think that, as usual, um, you know, Hackett yeah, is it. undermixed. Yes, very much Yeah, so. that's, mm -hmm. I put that in my notes. Do you know that? That's exactly another conclusion. I mean, I knew it anyway. Uh, it's, it's, it's you have one of the greatest easy. players available, and he's buried. Yeah, you got me young in the mix essentially, mm -hmm. right? I like, think, I think compositionally, I think it starts to falter a little bit towards the fourth, uh, towards the fourth side. I mean, I would say it would have been the ultimate three sided album, you know. Um, that that but, was gonna I mean, be the second point, you know. Having I, said that, it's one of my all time favorite albums, of course, it's in a, you know, top 10 for sure, maybe even a top five. I mean, I, you know, I love that. So, but you know how a lot of people say that the wall is too long, blah blah. No, it's not. I'm not. I am that guy with this record. Mm -hmm. To me, I, I, don't know. Yeah. I, like, think I, I think the waiting room is the best song on it. But <laughs> I love the waiting room. But I, I, I also it. think that you know, it, it could have used a little editing. It could have, <laughs> you know, for me, right? And I'm alone I, here. I'm, I, I already feel the winds of. Of here. The winds of, winds of hate. The winds of hate. Luis are getting the winds of hate. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican. But my <laughs> only point, though, is that this is this is really a, a classic. But it, I, I didn't actually make my list for mm. that for those two reasons. Because I, the other I one think, was just so so much better overall, right? I think that last side. I think they get caught up in what they're trying to do. You know, there's a, a concept and a story and it's bonkers and it's out there and they start, the rest of the album is builds and it flows and it kind of, you know, comes towards you and comes back again. Side four is trying to wrap things up. Yeah. And suddenly they seem to care about wrapping it up. They seem to care <laughs> about making a point, you know, and there are, it's over quirky, maybe that, and there are bits in that you just think, yeah, maybe didn't need that. but. Still, would it be the think same about, album without it? So it wouldn't, I, think, I wouldn't think change. About it. The I waiting wouldn't. room. Think about what band was putting out. You know, popular band was putting out something like the Waiting Room, one yeah. of their albums. 
Well, that's well, pretty fucked up too. It's, well, Ken, you you have um, bootlegs from um, from that tour. What's yep. that? Uh, just the Liverpool version itself, you know. And um, what's it? The Growing Again. Those mm -hmm. two versions alone are what's a you, you've never heard Genesis sound like that before. You know, they they predated Stereo Lab before Stereo Lab on those yep. two uh, on those two versions. Oh, just fantastic, man. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. We may see that again uh, before we. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, what do you got for number four? All right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, as I said, I didn't talk about any of these because I know they're going to get discussed and I'm happy to talk about them, but you know, I want to, I yeah. want to talk about some other stuff. So uh, this one's a stretch. Guru, guru, dance of the flames. Nice. So, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Guru Guru. Yes, love them. Okay. Uh, anything German, man. Right. So they were, a, <laughs> they were a German trio. Uh, Manny Neumeyer was the drummer. He was a jazz drummer, played with uh, Irene Schweitzer. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of came out of like the free jazz scene in Germany. And the guitar player was Axe Geinrich. And Uli Trepte was the original bass player. And then they went through a revolving door after a while of bass players. And they were originally this just total acid rock trio uh just crazy psychedelic jams and for dance of the flames hold it up again uh they went in a different direction and they got a new guitar player uh hushang uh, najapur who was the guitarist in Ilef, another german jazz rock band mm -hmm. and they went in this totally they just did a, a complete turn and they went into uh fusion territory and uh, this guy was just an insane player. I mean, he plays with speed and control like you've never heard before. Uh, so it's it's like it's like listening to like Mahavishnu Orchestra, but like turned up a notch. Some people think that his guitar uh, is just too over the top, but I mean, this album it just it kills and it kills and it doesn't stop killing. And when it's all over, you just you're like out of breath. It, it's just, it, it's got like a little of that acid tucked in there. Uh, you could hear it. There's some, some humorous parts. There's always some goofy uh, parts with Guru Guru, but this is, you know, full on fusion uh, with some of the most wicked, treacherous guitar work you have ever heard. Kind of Bill Connor ish. And I like his stuff. I like that album. Mm -hmm. I like, yeah. It's, yeah I, I think it's, yeah, it's just Ken, what's, the, what's the name of that one again? It's uh, Guru Guru Dance of the Flames. Dance of the Flames. Yep. That's homework for me here as well. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, I've never heard it. You like it. Mm -hmm. This guy's guitar work, it's just on a level. It's, you just, well, you'll hear it. Mm. You poke around on YouTube. You'll oh, find well. the CDs, the albums. Cool. Excellent. All right, Anthony. <clears throat> Number four. Uh, Camel Mirage, 1974. Uh, what can I say? Andy Latimer, the tone is like no other. Very Gilmore-esque. I always say, if I want to move for Gilmore, but I'm not listening to Gilmore, I listen to Mr. Latimer. Lady Fantasy, uh, Nimrod. Nimrod. Um, Nimrod. Nimrod <laughs> Procession and White Rider. Fantastic <laughs> tune. The opener, uh, Free Fall and Super Twister. Great flute playing by Pete Bardens. Uh, what oh, can I say? 1974, oh, Andy Latimer and the Boys, Mirage. Nice. nice. I'd argue that's the best Camel album. Um, I agree. I think it's, it's my favorite. It's, oh, <laughs> Lady my favorite. Fantasy. Or, maybe that or Moon Madness. Moon Madness. Moon Madness is great too, yeah. yeah. Right. Lady Fantasy, that's the killer. I mean, oh, yeah. man. Love it. Mm -hmm. All right, All right Chuck. Back to you. Right, my number four is from um, the third album by this wonderful group from Long Island, Royce the Cult Secret Treaties. You know, what's that? Um, in my opinion, this is their finest hour. You yes. know, what's that? Um, love this album. What's a, there's a lot of progressive rock on here, even if they don't consider themselves a progressive rock band. Every single song on this album, man, what's sort of from Career to a Career of Evil, Subhuman, um, Dominance and Submission, uh, you know, um, Harvester of Eyes, Flaming Telepaths, and the Closer, Astronomy, man. Killer album, man. You know, it's a, that, in my opinion, the finest hour, man. 
I would agree with that. It's my favorite VLC album, one of my favorite albums of the 70s. I agree you. with you too. Yeah. And yeah, they're one of those bands that like, you know, what are they, right? Because they sometimes get labeled a heavy metal band, which they're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've heard them get labeled a prog band. I think they do a little bit. They do psychedelia. They're certainly hard rock. They got some pop going on. They're, li- they're almost impossible to, to classify. You know that there are a lot of punk bands that actually cite them as a, uh, as a major influence on really? the tune. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right, George. Number four, Billy Cobham. Nice. Total Eclipse. Nice. Mm-hmm. He had uh, two albums in 74. This is the second. The first is the much ballyhooed Crosswinds. But for me, this kicks Crosswinds ass. I think so too, man. I say the same. Mm-hmm. You got the pedal to the metal on this album. You got the Brecker brothers and John Abercrombie with you. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, there's two epics, Solarization and uh, our favorite title tune on the channel, Sea of Tranquility. Mm-hmm. It's just a great, great album. Not a down moment on it, actually. Oh. Mm-hmm. And um, it's got uh, energy and a feel that I don't know that are on any of the other ones. It's got its own identity in his discog. So highly recommend this one. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Very good. One of the best drummers of all time. Ever. Yep. Yep. All right, Lewis. What do you got? All right. I want to preemptively apologize to the people of Finland because I'm about to murder some names, but <laughs> I can't do any better. Uh, my number four is Pekka Pojola, Haraka oh. Bialoi Poku, which means uh, the magpie of Bialoi Poku. This is it, bad boy over here. What, what a great, great, great bass player. And yes. a phenomenal, phenomenal. Pekka is uh, a genius, not just a bass player. He's he a, a, a great composer. 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 Mm-hmm. And uh, he is, uh, he did some stuff with Wigwam. And mm-hmm. then he you know, went off on his own, either making bands or just releasing these albums. And this one from 1974, I think is an ideal gateway for people who think that fusion is a lot of notes and no melody. Mm-hmm. I think that this is a good way for you to start listening and then get into fusion. It is an absolutely stunning, beautiful record. Take a pujola. Mm-hmm. Be the magpie is how they, they, they put it in English, right? Be the magpie. Be the magpie. Mm-hmm. Raise your hand if you're raise your hand if you're a peck ahead. <laughs> <laughs> We're all peckerheads here, right? Peckerheads. We, all, we don't care. He played. I saw him play in New York on your honeymoon, right? No, it was not my honeymoon. <laughs> my 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 wife. I'm on the orders. My wife. No, you know I can't talk. About this. Uh, <laughs> no, Rob, Rob, Silver, Rob Silverstein was releasing uh, some of Pekka's albums, and uh, on his on his label here, and he brought him over. He played in the Village. Got to see him wow. play. Uh, wow. In a small club, and. Yeah, he was Monster. amazing, man. You know, yeah. you know, um, but so for anybody that's never heard that guy, man, you, you talk about, like I said, just his compositions, man. Beautiful <clears> songwriting, <throat> man. You know, yeah, what's... I mean, he recorded with Mike Oldfield and they, they kind of, he had Mike Oldfield playing on his album. They repackaged it as a Mike Oldfield album. Right. But this this is just a beautiful record. It really and is. It, it has, it's, it's almost orchestral in some, in some mm-hmm. ways, but it's also very jazzy. It's really, mm-hmm. really beautiful. Yeah, I love this. He had, he had a nice orchestral album, The Visitor. Yes. You, you have that one? That's a good one. Yes. Symphonic album. Yeah. All right, my number four. Looks like Mr. Reed and I are in sync here tonight. No surprise. Uh, Land Lies Down on Broadway. Land Lies Down on Broadway. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Lewis, I, I'll take this over the wall any day. Wow. I, I think kind of the way you feel about this, I feel about the wall. I Half of the wall I love, the other half, eh. This I like the whole thing, and it's actually not that long of an album. When you're, you know, I mean, a double album back in the day, but it's really not that long. <clears throat> and I would, um, I would agree with a lot of what everybody said about it. Uh, this is just absolutely breathtaking songs on here. I, I will say though, I think even though he's kind of buried in the mix, I think there's a lot of hack guitar playing on the album. I think we hear more from him on this album than the ones before it, but yet he's not pronounced uh, with the way he should be. And I would say this might be the album of all the Genesis albums where uh, Tony Banks is playing. Is I mean, it's great on every album, but 
I, I tend to go to this album. I want to hear the most uh, Tony Banks. This for me is the album. It's just a, a stunning achievement. Uh, you know, I like some of the other albums that came before it a little better, but I still think this is like mandatory Genesis. And uh, yeah, Landline's Dynamo. However, Broadway. if you wish to appreciate the actual guitar part, you have to go see Steve Hackett play. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Then you'll, then you'll realize that there's a lot of stuff that is inexplicably buried. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So like, and, a, um, like a wind and weathering. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're like, why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand it, you know? Yeah. yeah he, but, um, he, he, he long felt compromised in that band, and that continued on even after he was out of the band. I mean, the, the most recent documentary where they sat down together Oh, and that's the point of making sure oh, that, that was... he was sitting about here somewhere <laughs> what was just ridiculous. I mean, oh, petty terrible. and yeah. stupid at all levels. I mean, to invite the guy in and then basically cut him out of the whole thing didn't paint him in a very good picture, in, in oh, my own opinion. It was ridiculous. Okay. Crazy. Yeah. You know, we talked about that on a previous episode where, like, you know, he goes and puts out, you know, he's still in the band. He goes and puts out The Voyage of the Acolyte, which is, you know, it sounds like the Genesis album they always should have done with him in the band, right? Mm -hmm. But yep. and, and the, a lot of those songs he brought to the band and they and they rejected them. It's like, well, why? Mm -hmm. What just because they didn't write them? I mean, I guess so, right? I don't know. Hey, hey Tony Banks. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> but we won't go there. I always wondered, like, I always wondered, did they, I always wondered, did they actually like like him? You know, as a person, know. Like, this makes you wonder. You know? mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, they did kind of, you know, there were there were things where, uh, if you go through like, you know, like the tape archives and stuff, where Gabriel came out at some, I think Hackett benefit show, and Gabriel, you know, performed with him, and Phil was on his solo album, yeah. right? So it was on Voyage, and uh, so there was like little bits of crossover, but you always sort of wondered, do they do they really care if he was in the band or not? Mm -hmm. you know? He was the out. Well, I guess he was he was threatening to leave before during the uh, selling Foxtrot. England sessions, and then Foxtrot. Mike and Tony said, "No, we want you to stay." Maybe they held yeah, that. Was, all of the stories, but so wanting to have a leader in the band, and Banks definitely saw himself as the leader, and anyone what, who would challenge that. I I agree with that notion. There has to be a leader, mm -hmm. but there also has to be a band. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is that is the issue that I have with it. Is he is arguably one of the best guitarists of his generation. He certainly brought a, a very unique touch and a very unique voice to the instrument mm -hmm. in that context. And then he's underutilized. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I've never understood that because mm -hmm. you know I, it's not like the guitar must be present, it, but the idea is it is there and it's great. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of mixing it better. You know, I think it's just a, a little less ego, a little better EQ, and you have a better mm -hmm. finished product. <laughs> what, was, yeah. what was said was what they did once he left, and they didn't replace it. You know, mm -hmm. at, at, back yeah. in the back then when he left, you know, the rumor was that they offered it to Gary Moore, and Gary Moore turned it down. No, and, Gary, Gary Moore actually um went to his um agent told him to turn it down because he wanted to uh, take the wow. take the role. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and the other name that I heard kicked around was Royal Bright. Mm -hmm. But yes. who knows if that, you know, if that's true. But you know, to have Mike Rutherford take over as the lead guitar player. <sighs> but you know what's the worst that, that they had the guy already in the in the tour. Yeah, Daryl, right? Yep. Daryl do not need anybody else. I mean, you look, you listen to some of that the those old uh, I mean, Anthony, the one that you sent to me that from the from the uh, and there were three tour. I mean, no, he no, rips. I mean, why mm -hmm. did they not let him play? Uh, Raising my hand here as a bass player. Don't make the bass player play the guitar. <laughs> well, I mean, with Sturmer as well, though. I mean, there's been recent interviews where he has alluded to strange dynamics within the yeah. personnel, uh, and that's gone on beyond that period of time again. So it's clearly just out personalities and clashes and egos. And I mean, it's in most bands, isn't it? But it's maybe just more obvious. They were less good at hiding it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shame. Anyway, all right, back to Stephen for number three. So number three for me, I mean, it's just, it's big band after big band after big band for oh. me. My favorite Kansas album. Yeah, my favorite Kansas album. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 
probably also the most progressive album, I would suggest as well. Yes. Uh, but it's just phenomenal. And the violin work mm -hmm. on this album's just ridiculous, isn't it? So it's, Earhart's drumming. Yes, oh, absolutely, yeah, isn't it? Um, I think it's Balexis where he's just thrown out there, isn't he? It's just phenomenal. But the whole album just hangs mm -hmm. together. It, it just is, I mean, right from the way the organs, the guitars, and then the violin, and then those layered vocals on Can I Tell You. I mean, that's how it starts, isn't it? You know, that's, that's, that's the opening of the whole catalogue right there. And they're just kind of going, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> and they went and did it. And I mean, realistically, the first four, five studio albums and the first live album are phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Stone Cold classic. And I'll still pick out, you know, things like Journey from Mara Braun, Death of Mother Nature Suite on here, oh, yeah. bringing it back. I mean, that's almost like Deep Purple formed on the other side of the Atlantic. It's just, there's so much to discover on here. It's such a great album and there's, there's such depth on it as well. So good. It's, I mean, I like so much Kansas. That they're one of the few bands that, yeah, there's better albums, there's worse albums, but right up to the present day, they're still releasing Great stuff. The last two albums have been fantastic. Mm -hmm. Very you know? well done. And I still come back to this and think it's the best one. So, yeah, that's, that's my number three. Nice. All right, Ken. All right. So, this is about as deep as I'm going to dig tonight. <laughs> Julian Priester, Love, Love. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. So Julian Priester is very regard well regarded trombonist, mm -hmm. and he played with Herbie Hancock in Herbie Hancock's Mwandishi mm -hmm. ensemble, and it carries on in that same Cosmic Groove style. It's two sidelong tracks, and it embraces spirituality, jazz rock, space rock, all with this African ethnicity. Uh, underneath it. It's an all-star lineup. Patrick Gleason is yep. playing uh, ARP mm -hmm. and Moog synthesizers. Todd Cochran, also known as Bayete, playing piano. We have Hadley Callaman on flute. Uh, Nadugo Leon Chancler and Eric Gravat playing drums. Mm -hmm. The skipper Henry Franklin uh, on bass, also Ron McClure on bass. And then you have Bill Connors of Return to Forever. Mm -hmm. He's playing That's electric guitar. guitar. Mm -hmm. So the first, it's two side long pieces and the first side is it starts out with this, like this funky groove and then it just sort of unfolds into this cosmic piece and everybody kind of gets to do their thing. And then you have Connors just like killing over the top. Mm -hmm. uh, the second side starts out a bit free. It's a little more out, but it's still cohesive. And then uh, Bayete sort of pulls it together. There's some beautiful piano runs on it. And it's just, somehow it just kind of works. It, it's, you know, if you're a fan of Bitches Brood or, or the Mwandishi trilogy, it, it's just more of the same. You know, a lot of the guys that played in Mwandishi, they went on with, with their solo careers doing very similar work. And this was uh, Julian Priester's. Um, and it, it was the first album he did for ECM. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I think it's a phenomenal album. Paul Weird, I picked three. Mm -hmm. My first three picks were like jazz rock albums. Oh, nothing wrong with that, then. No, but well, yeah, that's going to change in a minute. So. <laughs> that's, I need to hear that one too. I've never. Oh, you're yeah. going to like Fantastic. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paul Gleason really, and, and Billy Connors, they they fly on that. Yeah. Now. I love the Mwandishi album. So yeah, yeah, if you like that, I mean, you know, Eddie Henderson had great ones also. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, Love Love, same kind of thing. It's like one of those albums, man. You want to. You want to turn the lights down and you want to, you know, you just want, you just want to immerse yourself in it. There's, there's a lot going on. Cool. Nice. All right. Anthony, my center square. All right. Uh, here it comes. We all know the title track. 
Uh, we all know the, 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 the last track, but for me, my favorite tunes on this are uh, Fallen Angel and uh, One, One, One More, More Red, Red Nightmare, Nightmare, which Bruford just tears it up. I mean, his drumming on that is just phenomenal. Uh, so Red from 1974, uh, sadly, the ending when he, disp he disbanded the group afterwards, but a good friend of mine who's probably, he's about 70, 71, saw this tour in State College and said it was amazing. I uh, would have loved to have seen it. But uh, 1974 Red, uh, not much else I can say in the Prague community, but this one rocks. Did nice. they play Central Park on that tour? Yes. Mm -hmm. that, was yeah. the last, that was their last show. Last mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. July 1st, 1974. Yeah. But I don't think that, but didn't Red actually come out after? They played? Yeah, yeah after the tour. Mm -hmm. They came out like the fall of 74. Because, I mean, the album was kind of cobbled together. I mean, the out. The band was in disarray. I mean, they they yeah. had fallen, they've fallen apart. Uh, what's it? David Cross had left. Um, yeah. What's it? They tried to get. Um, they tried to recruit uh, Eddie uh, Eddie Jobson. So, but um... <laughs> <Everybody drink. laughs> Boy, Eddie Jobson makes appearance on the uh, USA Live album. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not an appearance, but overdubbed. <laughs> well, they talk, for talk. I guess he, they want to get Ian McDonald back. Yeah. Right? Man. Oh. But he, what's a they, all these guys were all tied up with different projects. Mm -hmm. So that's why, uh, what's a they just fell apart on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ian McDonald's on it. So he's yes, playing he sax, Mel mm -hmm. Collins. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, Chuck. All right. <laughs> My number three, Herbie Hancock, Thrust. You no, know, that's my first fusion album of the day. Um, what more can we say about this great album? You know, what's the um, this is a, part, a time where he was doing like two or three songs per album, and he just continued to just um kill on this album. Actual proof, palm grease, my favorite, butterfly, and spanker lee, man. Just just outstanding material over here, man. Thrust 1974, Herbie Hancock. Oh, that was about the coolest cover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stunning yep. album. Great stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, George. <clears throat> nice. Eleventh oh, dream. Eleventh house. Eleventh house. <laughs> house. Mm -hmm. Debut from this band. Uh, probably depending on who you talk to, they either the best of the second tier of the fusion bands, or they should be in the first. I mean. The problem was they were a couple of years behind those years other too bands. late. Yep. yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe some people, I mean, one of the members is full-time members is a trumpet player. Mm -hmm. Trumpet doesn't sit well with a lot of people, perhaps. I don't know, but uh very intense album. And the first track, Bird Fingers, is just that kicks you right in the head. <laughs> I hunted this this version down on uh, Amazon. It's a mid-2000s reissue because it's got three bonus tracks. Cover Girl from Muzan. It's got to be as good as anything on here. Mm -hmm. It's a pre Brecker Brothers version of Rocks. Really good. Mm -hmm. So it was worth it to get this version, even though it's got kind of an odd shape. It's like taller more than wider. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Can't fit that no place. Uh, yeah. They went on to do a few more albums that are all good, but to me, this is still the best. No, mm -hmm. by far. Mm -hmm. but, cool. All their albums are really strong, though. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, Larry Corey, old man, a couple of years ago. That's good. Mm -hmm. What a player! Yeah, he was. He was outstanding, man. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. All right, Lewis, back to you. Well, I want to thank George because he he broke a tie that I had in my head. He already <laughs> mentioned Arte Misteri Tilt, right? Mm -hmm. Arte nice. Misteri, I, I think it be, it, it translates in, in into arts and crafts. That's yes. the name of the band. Mm -hmm. So instead of this one, which is phenomenal, this is a must buy mm -hmm. for people who don't have this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go with a personal favorite. This is not easy listening. I got in trouble with my wife the other day for playing this too loud, but that's fine. <laughs> this is, um, she normally likes Prague, but this is really not easy listening. <laughs> this is by another Italian band called Aria. Aria. Mm -hmm. Caution Radiation. Yeah. Love it, mm -hmm. love it. This mm -hmm. record is, that's just there. stunning. One of my favorite. You really things. have to immerse yourself into it in order to to to, to really appreciate it, right? But mm -hmm. man, I love this band. I mean, these guys. 
I know that that you know it's not popular to talk about lyrics and all that, but but these guys always addressed issues in their records, and that way mm -hmm. they were kind of like like Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. And this talks a lot about you know radiation hazards and the problems that that could happen. You know, mm -hmm. it's a really fantastic record. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I would highly recommend anybody who's interested in what might happen if you blend Italian opera singers with you know. Peter Hamill? Yeah. <laughs> you should give this a shot. Mm -hmm. It's really, really good. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a little jarring. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, that that's kind of the, what they're trying to evoke. They're trying to evoke nuclear fire. This is mm -hmm. bad shit. Right? It's a fallout from um, World War II. Um, we'll this is, this is great. This, I, I love this. This, this, this. this Everything this band does to me is, is like magic. But mm -hmm. 1974, so... Now we get to mention them also. Nice. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right, my number, where are we three? Number three, uh, Relayer from Yes. Nice. Mm -hmm. Could have even ranked higher, but just goes to show you how much, you know, the other two, I think uh, I probably listened to a little bit more, but Relayer is great. Patrick Moraz is uh, one and only studio album with the band. Uh, the, doing these, you know, long form tracks. Uh, obviously they've been influenced by a lot of the fusion stuff that was going on at the time. Gates of Delirium was one of their best epics ever. Sound Chasers, Pure Fusion, <laughs> and then we got the lovely To Be Over. Uh, mm -hmm. Just amazing. Probably my favorite, well, either this or Dramas, or, well, close to the edge too, but some of my favorite uh, Steve Howe guitar solos on here. And I think Moraz just fits so well into the band i mean quite frankly i know probably not popular to say if he would have stuck around and wakeman didn't come back i think i would have been okay with that mm. you know I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah it's like he's just he's incredible on here and he's just and if you listen to some of the other prog stuff he did around that same time outside of yes he was a perfect fit for this band so yep. it's hard to imagine wakeman playing those this parts. stuff yeah, yeah. i agree mm -hmm. it's not his style mm -hmm. yeah True, true. But uh, and, a, and a fantastic Roger Dean uh, artwork job there. So yeah, that's my number three relay. That may be, that may be my favorite yes album. It's the top three for me easily. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's usually one of the, the number worst, two. One of the worst produced, but yeah, it's not fantastic. But it's yeah. you know, it, the songs are just so great. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's the greatest instrumental album that never was. <laughs> right. If there were no vocals in that album, would anybody? I mean, we love John, but would anybody really care? I, I would. I'd be okay. Ah, uh, please. You know, the interesting thing is that somebody, they were, can somebody remix it without the two main problems, the John and the Anderson? I'll be all over that. The interesting thing is the guys from Return to Forever acknowledge Relayer. <coughs> yes. As you know, uh, that was sort of their inspiration for Romantic Warrior, mm -hmm. and I, I think there was a bit of cross-pollination between those two bands yeah. uh, musically. Uh, certainly with Moraz's style, you know, his supposedly jazz background, I can't find any evidence of him ever recording anything other than, you know, Main Horse and, and Refugee. So, but supposedly they always said he was like a jazz player, but he certainly brings that, uh, that feeling yeah. to, to the album. That's why I said, I, I, can't, I can't see uh, Wakeman playing Playing that material. This is, this is beautiful, beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. It really is, man. Mm -hmm. And man, that main horse album is killer. Killer. Yeah. I love that album. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. Jeez. Anyway. <laughs> Stephen, back to you. Well, I think that you and I have been copying each other's homework. And we didn't talk at all. So yeah, oh. this, this just mm -hmm. kind of happened, right? Yeah. Because it's my number two. There you go. It's good. I mean, I, I've spoken an awful lot tonight already, so I don't need to say very much now because it's already been said. But is it my favourite Yes album? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it probably is. Um, and it's interesting that my favourite Yes albums can often not have Wakeman on them. Well, But yeah, th this album couldn't happen with him on it, in my humble opinion. Uh, he just plays in a completely different way. Um, and the, the whole album, the whole band just seemed to evolve into something totally recognisable but completely different. Do you know, this is this this is a Yes album. There's no two ways about it. You put it on, it can't be anybody else. The, the bass sounds, the guitar sounds, the vocals, 
Mm-hmm. Alan White's Unmistakable. drumming. Unmistakable and the drumming, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Unmistakable. And then you add just a different element in there and boom, this album's just ridiculously good. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think that is Alan White's best recorded album. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Same. Nope. Yeah, that's I think that's fair to say. Absolutely. So yeah, that, that's that's my number two. And it was really difficult for me not to put this at the top spot. Really difficult. But there's just one more that that just went over the edge for me. But yeah, really it was just phenomenally good. I can listen to it every day. All right, Ken. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm 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 returning to prog rock land. My number two pick, Eloy. Oh, Eloy, floating, floating. Mm-hmm. Another Eloy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we talked about Eloy last mm-hmm. time. Last week. Mm-hmm. So, uh, after the you know the band's debut, the first album with Garbage Can Cover, that was like a shit sandwich, and <laughs> then they recovered, and there was a lineup change, and they did Inside in 73 and they did floating in 74 uh this is kind of like a continuation of inside you know frank borneman he's he's totally in control on, on this album i mean he's the he's he's clearly the leader the sound is very much like in the british like british hard rock style of bands like deep purple uriah heap but you also get influences of like you'll hear similarities to nectar mixed in there uh, it's all organ and guitar, really. Uh, Mafford White Soccer was the uh, is the keyboard player. He just plays organ. He doesn't screw around with any synthesizers. That came that came later on, and it's all about the interplay between uh, White Soccer and Borneman's guitar, which had a little bit more of like a psychedelic uh, style to it. Uh, the tracks are longer. They sh- they stretch out. Frank sings, unfortunately, but it's it's a bit more sparse. There's a lot of room for these guys to, to really ignite. Uh, the standout is a almost 15 minute piece called the light from deep darkness. And they all stretch out, uh, stretch out. And Fritz Randau, the drummer, I mean, he almost, he almost steals the, 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 uh, the album. It's, uh, it's just one of the great uh, German uh, prog albums. Uh, and yeah, I would think anybody who's into even like, I think we talked about last night, Pete, like, you know, those, first couple of scorpions albums yeah oh yeah you know lonesome crow fly to the rainbow uh, and if you like british bands like we're saying like early deep purple uh early uriah heap i think mean, you know right in your wheelhouse mm-hmm. yeah yeah a lot of organ on those first couple <laughs> mm-hmm. albums yeah. mm-hmm. it's really good stuff really good really you good mean stuff. early deep purple like tales of Tennyson or like no 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 no, 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 no. Mm-mm. No, like you know, in rock and fireball, like that, you know, yeah, fireball. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Very, so. very John Lord esque, Deep Purple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right, Anthony, back to you. All right, my number two from 1974 is—is is it this, or is it this? <laughs> <laughs> Relayer from 1974, what's up and said, Roger Dean, beautiful artwork, uh, fantastic vocals by Luis Nazar's best bud, John Anderson. Uh, as Pete has said, uh, Deep House solo on Sound Chaser is just insane. Uh, the background vocals of Squire is just insane. Gates of Delirium, epic as of all epics. Gorgeous. I got to see it live in 2000 when Kansas and them were torn and they were doing uh, when you could actually vote online for the set list, get to delirium. They play it was amazing. So nice. I'm going 1974. Yes. Relay. Nice. I think, uh, I think how play, if I'm, if I remember correctly, played that solo on sound chaser on a telecaster, if I remember correctly. Yes. That's what he said he did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty mm-hmm. cool. Should have stayed with it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you should have never gone to the line six guitar oh, gosh. no no not at all no. all right chuck back to you all right man well uh, what's it it might not be um anthony's buddy but he's one of my favorite guys um brian eno taking tiger mountain by strategy wow. you know 1974 you know what's it has um quite a few um amazing players on here you know some of his buddies from um, Roxy Music, um, 
Uh, Phil Manzanero on guitar. Uh, Fred Smith from um, what's it from what's it? Uh, Fred Smith uh, from um, television, if I'm not mistaken. They had quite a few people on here. Phil Collins even plays on this album as well. Wow. You know, he always says that that was his payment album. You know, for for Brian Eno doing some enofiscation on um, the Lamb Lies Down. But seriously, this album right here, man. You know, what's it? You could see just how much uh, Roxy Music, as great as they are, and still continue to have been, um, how much they lost, <coughs> excuse me, when when he left the album. But you could see that he had a great big, um, big vision, but, you know, Brian Eno, Brian Ferry, too many eagles right there, man. Yeah. This album right here, man. Third uncle. Uh, now, Third Chuck, uncle. The, Third uncle. <laughs> the, the, the follow-up to that is amazing yes mm -hmm. brand x mm -hmm. <laughs> very cool <clears throat> all right george what do you got for number two no surprise oh yeah nice. <clears throat> or have i known you before i mean vulcan kickoff track vulcan world's probably one of the best stanley clark compositions mm -hmm. uh shadow of low by lenny white is the best song he contributed to the band yep. mm -hmm. And you got the big epic from Chick, Song to the Pharaoh Kings. Beautiful. Got that Egyptian feel that I'm surprised that no metal, prog metal band has ever covered it because they mm -hmm. can really adapt it very easily. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. I'd probably like it as much as Pete, if not for a couple of issues. One being Earth Juice is the worst song the quartet did. It's like a <laughs> disco tune. Yeah. I don't know what they were thinking. I think radio play because it was on a single at some point. And uh, my bugaboo with all the piano solos interspersed in, make give it that patchy feel. But uh, the other, the, the big songs, the big set pieces on here carry the day. It's great, great, great album. That it is nice, beautiful. <laughs> all right, Lewis, number two. All right, so my number two, you gotta go to Uncle Frank apostrophe apostrophe. Mm -hmm. I mean, nice, come, right? This has got Ruth. Mm -hmm. It has Jean Luc. It mm -hmm. has uh, George Duke. This is it has Jack Bruce playing mm -hmm. a, a blistering bass solo on, on the title track. Yes, I mean, as he at does least bark. allegedly, I've heard people say that it wasn't actually him, just like chunks. I don't know. I was obviously I was five, so I have no, no clue what happened <laughs> in Los Angeles where they recorded this. But I I can say. <laughs> without any any issue that this record changed my life. This was my entry point to the world of Zappa. Mm -hmm. And because um, the other, the first time I heard Zappa, I I, uh, I played um, the Grand Wazoo. Mm -hmm. a, a friend of mine, his sister was moving from Mexico to England and she had a stack of albums and everybody had picked through it and all that was left was Zappa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <So Zappa. laughs> and, I, I looked at the cover of the Grand Wazoo and I thought, this is great. But I was like a teenager. I was tr trying to write music, right? I thought I could have some kind of, you know, ability. And that was the first time I put a, a needle to a record and I heard something that was not from this fucking planet. Mm -hmm. That had no relevance to anything that I could possibly ever conceive. And my reaction as a 12-year-old is, the 13 was, this didn't fucking happen. <laughs> I put it away. <laughs> not real fuck this shit and I, uh, I iron maiden and other stuff thinking yeah i can do this i can play this fucking thing i can i can, I can do this i can't even think like that right? <laughs> and uh my later i i try it again and this is the one where i started right and now of course the grand wazoo eat that question etc what a masterpiece but yeah apostrophe 1974 my first album as well from frank zappa mm -hmm. What an album. It, it's a great album. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's from his, to me, his best period, right? I mean, yeah. those couple albums right around that time yeah. are just... Overnight you know, Sensation. And, uh, you know. One Size Fits All. I mean, it's, can't, can't beat him. Can't beat him. All right. My number two, um, I, I think if we would have done this like five years ago, I don't think it would have made my top five, although I always loved it. I think I love I love it more as time goes on. We a couple of you guys have mentioned ones that would have made my list and are in my honorable mentions because they're right up there. Um, but I just fall in more in love with this album as each year goes on. Super Tramp, Crime of the Century. Beautiful. My favorite uh, top ten um, prog album of all time. 
Love it's, it. I, just, I, I was hoping somebody would mention that. Mm -hmm. It's so it. good. It's just so good. I mean, top to bottom, it's just absolutely classic. Um, man, school, mm -hmm. legendary, right? Rudy, legendary, bloody well right, the title track, the uh, title track, uh, asylum, <laughs> dream. I mean, just lovely, lovely stuff, and so amazingly produced. I think mm -hmm. it's just it's to me, to my ears anyway. Uh, it's one of the most amazing sounding albums I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. It's yep. just, it's just total, total ear candy and, uh, you know, great musicianship. The, the vocals are amazing. The songs are so memorable. It's mm -hmm. just absolutely <laughs> incredible album. Could have been my number one, but my number one, we'll get to in a couple of minutes. So nice. back to Steven. So my number one is number two because it's, Queen two. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's <laughs> slightly bigger for me to be part of the band, but this is stupendously good. I mean, I've gone, I've gone quite vanilla. I must admit. I've, I mean, these are I've just picked <laughs> my five favorite albums from '74. I mean, there's so many great choices and so many great picks that we've <clears throat> gone through. And I usually like to try and throw in a few curveballs and things. And I looked at 74 and just thought, I've got to be true to myself and just pick the ones that yes. have just, I mean, I was I was one in 74, but that have traveled with me throughout my musical journey. And this is, I mean, Queen to me when I was growing up was I Want to Break Free and Radio Gaga and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. It was <clears throat> good songs, you know, great rock songs. and But I didn't really understand why they were revered in the way that they are. And it took me to venture backwards. And this was bought secondhand in whatever year, I don't know, and has still stood the test of time somehow. And this was the album that made me go, oh, okay, right, well, I've missed the point entirely here. Do you know, it's not just all about the chorus. It's not just that the guy's got a nice guitar tone. Do you know, they were writing music that was just out there, especially for 74. Nobody I've sounded been. Nobody sounded like this. Mm -hmm. Do you know? And I know that that probably, it's fair to say that you can say that about quite a lot of the music we've spoken about. I would, and I'm going to be controversial here, I would suggest that this album has influenced more music since than almost anything. <laughs> <clears throat> the amount of Queen that you hear and so much music out there from pop to rock to prog, it's just everywhere. The structure's on here, the vocal harmony is on here. I mean, you've got pop songs, Seven Seas Are I, but it's a rock song, but it's a prog song. Mm -hmm. it's, it's everything, it's nothing, and it doesn't care. Do you know, you've got three great vocalists on this album. You know, you've obviously got Freddie, you've got Roger, Brian has a go. <laughs> Do you know, but it's just outstanding. Ogre battle. Oh, I mean, it's immense. Watch the Black Queen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The whole thing. How about, how about the segue battle. from Ogre battle yeah. to Fairy Feller, Stephen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but even the opening three, it's just the whole thing. And it's constructed as an album. This is constructed as an album. Uh, that's a lost art these days to some extent, but a large extent. But back then, I mean, most of the albums we've spoken about were constructed as albums, but this is a journey from start to finish. And you play it now, and it sounds fresh. It's, they, it's like it was done just, just yesterday, but thankfully it wasn't. It was done in 74 because it's so much better for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds fantastic. I mean, this is, this is a horrible reissue. It's not even an original pressing that I got. It's a horrible fame re And this still sounds fantastic. It's ridiculous. I mean... It sounds better than it looks now because it's all because it's, this is done some time. How many, jo how many <laughs> joints did you roll on that thing? <laughs> is that from you, Stas Ken? <laughs> I, I, I know I'm going to be excommunicated for this, but I was never a fan of that really? band of Queen. Mm -hmm. So that's, I don't, don't want to be a downer. I don't want to be a downer. I, I mean, I, I, I appreciated like Day at the Races, Night at the Opera, those albums. I, the production, which mm -hmm. I thought, you know, Roy Thomas Baker, I thought, I thought it was great, and they were great songs. But uh, the early album, Sheer Heart Attack, I don't know. It, right. To me, 
they were just a hard rock band. Uh, sure, Heart Attack is my favorite album by them. Um, <clears throat> but so that's my Queen Two is my number two. Um, what's that? I'm not the biggest Queen fan myself, and so, but I do love uh, certain albums by them, and you know, a few songs here and there. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some, <laughs> but that's a great album. Better turn the phrase. There's some rubbish in the catalog. There's quite mm-hmm. a lot of rubbish in the catalog. Yeah. They went through a whole era where really, if you can find two or three songs to like, then you're maybe doing better than I can. And some of the hits, I mean, I'm about to throw myself under the bus here. Things like Under Pressure, I I hate that song. (laughs) Oh, I love Under Pressure. Wow, really? (laughs) Oh, I just can't tell you much I dislike that song. But I I agree with everything you've said, except one thing. I don't think that they're influential, because I think they're uncopyable. Yes. I think that I think that I I, I, I I don't know anybody who plays who doesn't own a copy of that in Queen One and loves them. I don't mm-hmm. know anybody. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, how can you even try to replicate it? The darkness. Let's just let's just begin with, with Brian May's guitar tone. Yep. That is not <laughs> simple to copy. I, and I then even Deacon's bass is not. It's not an obvious bass tone to copy. That guy was an electrical engineer. He knew how to wire his stuff to get a particular, you know, EQ. so everything about these records is, is very unique, right? And then, of course, Freddie, right? That, that is like, you know, a genie came out of a bottle <laughs> and he's dressed in, in the most flamboyant costumes and he's just delivering incredible music. So... I, I I agree with you. I think it's a it's it's a monumental record. It's immense, but I don't think that it's 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 aspirational. But it doesn't influence you because you can't really copy it. I think, I think a lot of people. I think a lot of people are trying. I think yes, a lot of people have tried. And I think the the thing for me is that a lot of people, not many bands thought, well, we could go be Queen. Right. Muse maybe have. I think there's an element of them at one point where they thought, well, let's be Queen. However, I would suggest there's lots of prog bands took aspects of Early Queen. There's a huge amount of rock bands that took aspects of Early Queen and thought, you know what, we can just make simpler music. Yeah. Bashing Pumpkins. And write massive hits and, and be really popular by following that formula. I'm so not they watered the queen. put it all together, yeah. but lots of bands took a bit from here and a bit from there. And I love that sound and I love that guitar run. And, and there's so many albums over the years that I've thought, oh, that little bit sounds like Queen. And it's not an accident. You don't sound like those areas and aspects of Queen right. by accident. Unless well, you try and really hard, right? yeah. 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 So I, I appreciate what you're saying because nobody else has sounded like that. And they couldn't. You're absolutely right. There's too many unique aspects that came together in that band for anyone to sound like them. But so many bands have, well, let's not say influenced, stolen. They've stolen right. little bits and right. used them here and used them there. And, and still, I review albums and listen to albums this year and thought, mm, hey, they've listened to Ellie Queen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know what's funny? I get asked all the time for years, Pete, do you think the Queen were a prog band? And I always say no, but that is, that is their prog album. For yep. sure. that's, that's it. That's maybe the one. Yeah, I mean, the, the race is night the opera quirky. Have their moments. Have their that, moments. Yep. Yep. No right to be there, but they work. But they're not yep. necessarily progressive. Queen two, to me, certainly. Well, obviously, yep. that's probably. Yep. 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 Cool. All right, Ken, you're number one. You know, <clears throat> I'd be curious if you and I have the same one. I bet we do, Ken. You think? We'll see. I don't know. We'll see. All right, so might I don't know. Same, might be the same band. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> so, you know, some people might not call this prog rock, but I don't really care. So, for me, this is one of the best albums of '74 and one of the greatest albums of all time. Robin Trower, Bridge of Sighs. Yes. <laughs> nice. So, nice. Robin, I mean, you know, he was the master of the Stratocaster. Mm-hmm. And Bridge of Size is one of the greatest rock guitar albums of all time. Uh, he was the uh, former guitarist from Procol Harum, um, mm-hmm. and he went out on his own. And he right away kind of got tagged as a Hendrix clone, played a Stratocaster, used the wah-wah pedal. But, uh, hmm? 
He doesn't play anything like Hendrix. No, <laughs> and not really. Other than you know, no. and you know, he had a great band. There's a vibe. There's a vibe about the both of them. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy Duar on bass, and he was and, and Duar. Oh, was what a vocalist! Fantastic what, vocalist. What a vocalist, man! Yeah, fantastic. And Reg Isidore played drums at that point, and it's just some of the most incredible guitar solos in in, in recorded history, in in my opinion. You know, it's it's just pure power. You get those soulful vocals from Duar, uh, Trower. It's just, I mean, a lot of it's a lot of sustained notes, but this speed that I mean, it runs the gamut. And you know, the band at times, you know, they 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 kind of they just sort of get into a groove. It gets like a touch of, touch of funk. And, you know, if, if you've ever played guitar, there's a good chance you own this album. Mm -hmm. So and the loudest concert I ever saw was Robin Trower. Really? Wow. Yeah. I think it was at the Ritz in New York. I actually went on set list to see, to confirm that. I thought it was 81, but they didn't have anything listed from touring in 81. But, man, I got to tell you, he was playing and I was off on the side. And it just got louder and louder. And I was like like a, a fly or a moth drawn to a light. And I just kept getting closer and closer to the stage. Uh, it was uh, he was he was he was fantastic. Just just an amazing guitar. He's player. he's been one of my favorite players for most of my life. He's just yeah, I, mean, I mean he's this the album's not on my list because to me it's kind of kind of borderline here with prog. But um, if we were looking at overall music from 74, yeah, of course. I couldn't I couldn't leave it off. I mean, yeah, I hear you, and I'm kind of glad you, you did because I think it's, it's you know, I was, I was also going to put that on my list as well. Mm -hmm. I have a stack, you know, it's funny, like I, you know, we go get to like honorable mentions. I got a stack of albums over here that I'm kind of surprised haven't turned up yet. So it, it yeah. was, there were just so many to pick from. Yeah. But I just, man, this is just one of those albums you put it on, you have to listen to the entire album. Yeah. Because it's just, it never gets tired. The solos never get tired. And you just want to hear what he's going to do next. And some of the best songs on that album are not the ones that he always played live that you heard on the radio occasionally. The Deep Cut uh, album. Are yep. sure. mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, you know, those, all his earlier albums, you know, For Earth Below. Which I think is my favorite, actually. I love For Earth Below. Mm -hmm. so, so do I. Yeah. I mean, those like those first three albums or so, yeah. they're twice removed from yesterday. Really, really great. And, uh, but, this is to me. This is the epic. This is the motherfucker. This is the one. Yeah. So, nice. Cool. Nice. My number one for seven eight. I got some other great ones here, but cool. Yeah, I think we all do. <laughs> Anthony, what do you got for number one? Uh, my number one has been already said before, but okay. The Lamb. Uh, what hasn't been said. Uh, some of my favorite tracks on here are "Fly to the Windshield," which is a has a fantastic Hackett solo. Uh, I think "Anyway" is really an underrated tune. Yep. Uh, I love live. the Lamia, uh, uh, "Silent," uh, the Colony of Slipper Men. Uh, what, what, what? No filler at all on this, and I do love the Wall just as much as I love this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, Gabriel Swan song, "All About Rail," 1974. My number one, "The Lamb." I appreciated it more when I saw the music box play it live. Mm -hmm. That'd been awesome. That was a really great, great experience with all the all the original Genesis props and everything. And they, they were doing all the they whole do a great job that band. Yeah. When when I I remember seeing the um, the first time I saw it with um when um the uh, Martin Levac was still with the band. Yes, um, he, he which, was, and uh, and he absolutely, but but to that specific lineup with Dave Myers and Martin Levac, they just actually just destroyed that album. It was so great, so great done. Uh, I I loved. It. I saw that um, downtown. I forgot the name of the college downtown in, in Manhattan. I saw it. It was a pretty good show, man. You know, but like you said, you get to appreciate it live. You know, you know, at that time, you know, there weren't too many bootlegs around. So, you know, you just but just had to just wish that you could see what was going on there. But they, they were pretty good, the musical box live. Mm -hmm. Especially well, that you know, from, from just a technical point of view, the guys played it a lot more than Genesis did. Yeah. Yeah. So they mm -hmm. just had it better rehearsed and they mm -hmm. just had it, it. It was better. Right. Mm -hmm. they, they just performed it better. 
you know. It's easier, it's easier when you have the blueprint laid out for you. Exactly. <laughs> they were just copying. They weren't making it up. They weren't. Mm-hmm. They weren't creating it. So they just said, "All right, thank you. We'll just, we'll just do it, right?" So, mm-hmm. but they, they delivered it very convincingly. Right? There were no, no pickles, no flubs. It was good, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, Chuck, you're number one. Oh, my number one. Well, you know, as I continue to say all the time, so Genesis is my favorite band of all time. The Lamb Lies Down is my favorite album of all time. But um, I didn't pick any Genesis. You know, which, uh, I didn't pick that album. My number one is from my second favorite band of all time, Weather Report, Mysterious oh. Travelers. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, what's that? Um, anytime. Anytime. <laughs> I knew someone was going to have something that I had. Yes. <laughs> Anytime you have Joseph Zawinu and Wayne Shorter work together, man, you know, that's just magic in the air right there, man. You know, you have two of the greatest composers, two of the great instrumentalists, and the two greatest innovators of their generation. And they created perhaps one of their finest albums of all time. Not a single bad song on this album. And in my opinion, their most underrated song on this album is um, Jungle Book, the very last song on there. You know, you get to hear um, uh, the, uh, Joseph Zawinu, um composition, and it's just brilliant, man. Alfonso Johnson's first um, foray with the band, yep. and Maris, uh, Miroslav Vitos, you know, sadly, you know, he leaves after American Tango, but still just a great album. My favorite album from 1974, Mysterious Traveler, Weather Report. All right, good choice. George, your number one. Uh, would have been uh, same as Stephen Queen too, but I recall several times that we've said that Queen. We weren't going to talk about Queen on the proxy because they're not. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> oh well, I, I didn't know it was breaking rules. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be careful because Steve will give you a cocktail kiss. <laughs> if you put it down, Queen. I agree. If there's one album that is prog, it's this one, but I didn't say it. So you guys have all said it, or a few of you have. Relayer. Relayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Intense Epic. Sound Chasers in my Yes top five songs easily, just for the fact that it's so different from everything else they've done. Mm-hmm. But the, all the guys that have mentioned this album, you. None of you touched on the elephant in the room, which is to be over. Mm-hmm. If it's not a bad song, it's kind of directionless. It doesn't really hang in there together. <clears throat> Imagine if you swap that out for one of the ones on close to the edge that are about the same length, maybe and you and I. You could be talking about the best album of all time. I mean, mm-hmm. really, really good. Mm-hmm. Oh, really. Nice. Baby. I, I, you know what? I, I take like maybe like the best 10 minute piece from Tales from Topographic Oceans, put that on there, and then we're playing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like way. Topographic Oceans. I, but I, think it, it's, I, think uh, I think I'm the only one here that loves that album. <laughs> I, I don't dislike it, Chuck. I mean, I like Tales. Tales is great. I love that album. Mm-hmm. Uh oh, uh oh, I see Lewis shaking his head. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just going to say, Tales of Soporific Oceans is not for me. <laughs> I mean, it meanders. It's, it's, it certainly meanders a bit. <laughs> but it's too hippie. It's too, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. And, uh, no, no. No. <laughs> He'll come around to it. Uh, like for me, like it, it's progressive rock. It has to rock. Mm-hmm. It can't just float in a in a in a valley of unicorns and fairies. It has to have <laughs> some fucking balls. Otherwise, I'm not interested. So this is my position, right? I, that's a t-shirt I want. I want in the valley of unicorns on my t-shirt. <laughs> Ken's not liking that one too much. <laughs> All right. <sighs> Would have been a good three. Another one that would have been a good three-sided album. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 one. Yeah. Yeah. I like. I love parts of the Grave of I just find the whole thing. It's a little hard to take in. One it meanders. Second. It meanders. It does. It does. Yeah. It does. Anyway, Lewis, you're number one. All right. So this is a record that for me is also monumental. <laughs> It's so good, but not even the the, the terrible turd that is Providence can ruin it. 
I'm talking about King Crimson Red. And yes, I know. How, who am I to say it's a turd? It's my opinion. It's just my ears, right? But when you when you compare it to, you know, Fallen Angel, Red, Starless, and one more Red Nightmare, you're wondering, all right, they needed eight more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just do something, right? <laughs> we don't want to see each other. Let's just finish this up, right? This is my impression of that tune. But everything else is just so, so good. You know, it's just... Um, I don't know. For me, it's just the, it's not, it's it, 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 from that year, especially. I mean, there's nothing that I like more. I had to go with what the heart wants, right? For me, mm -hmm. it's that right. That's right. That's right. Nice. My number one. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I agree with everything Lewis just said. It's just, I don't even mind Providence that much, but the rest of it is just like, Outstanding. it's like otherworldly right and and to think and we kind of touched on it before that this was the last thing we would hear from these you know three guys together it's just like come on man i mean you, you talk about going out on top of the world i guess but geez there was no let up in anything for this with this album and you know this this lineup i mean this era in the band to me is just like one of the greats of all time so uh kind of had to be at my number one but uh but there's so many other good ones that I didn't even mention today. I'm sure everybody's got an oh, mentions list. So, I mean, I'm really got, curious got, to see what else we got here. So I Steven, got a stack. I got, yeah, a, stack I got a bunch of them too. Yeah. So Stephen, just you don't have to go too in depth on either any of them, but just fire them off. What do you got? I, I don't have a huge stack. I mean, I, I'm just in the house. Um, just in the house. Scottish is that? I'm just in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I'll try and not do that. <laughs> Most of what I had has been mentioned, Crimson, Eloy, Camel. One that struck me as we were going round, I might have the year wrong. Todd Rundgren's Utopia. No, you got it. That's right. That's that's right. That's that's right. That's 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 one that arguably we'll should have been in my week. five. I don't know why it didn't. But I, I hated myself for not fitting into the top five. Yeah, I love that album. Yeah, that's a great one. That, that one just passed me by as I was putting the list together. So as we were going round, I was like, yeah, that should be there. So what I have, I've got two quirkier ones that I've put aside, and Mike Oldfield, Hergis Ridge, mm -hmm. I, I think that's his crowning achievement. I, I mean, I know the other ones are more popular, but I just love that album. It's fantastic. Um, and I've really, I've gone a bit, I've cheated a little with my last one. It's, is it prog? I don't quite know what other show would fit on, okay? And it's not a great album, but what it created was great because live what came from Tony Ashton and John Lord oh, just oh. bonkers oh. utterly bonkers do you know so this is first of the big bands I, I really like this album it's a really tough deal I've never even seen that no, um, no. family meets <laughs> family. all right I'm gonna take some notes I'm gonna find that now oh. yeah so right, okay. thank you I mean this is this is just two guys letting loose. It took years to put together, supposedly, three or four years, and then it was held back for another year before it was released. Um, I, I mean, oh, you've got this. guys like, hold on, I've, I've written it, because there's no detail at all on this. I mean, it's literally just got, this, that, that's, that's what's on the back. <laughs> Absolutely it's nothing. Love. But you've got guys like Peter Frampton playing on here, Cozy Powell appears on here, Dave Caswell is on here. And it is, it's... 70s rock, it's got horns on it. It's oh mad. My God, horns. And as an album, you think, uh oh, Anthony. <laughs> uh, Anthony, cover your ears. There you go, sir. <laughs> as an album, it's really good. But then if you go and look for some of the live shows, and really, to be fair, also by the time that Ian Pace had joined and Miles in Wonderland comes around, go and find some of the live stuff on. YouTube that I've been watching the past couple of days again. It's got Rory Gallagher playing guitar on it, and watch Tony Ashton, who is on another planet as he goes through some of these songs, and it's just off the scale. So I've cheated a little because it's not really about that album for me. But without that album, it wouldn't have happened. So there you go. That's that's all I've got from this. It's a Bonzo um, Bonzo Duda of uh, Duda um, band. Meets Bonzo do that dog band bad. Yeah. meets 10cc yeah. mm -hmm. yes that's yeah there you go i like that that's good yeah interesting it's a 
it's a really interesting listen to that album, but as I say, if you like it, or even if you like it a little, go and watch some of the live clips that are out there because they're just phenomenal. The standard of playing is brilliant. They're loving it. They, they love it. Watching musicians who are in that moment, the way they're in that moment, does it for me. And that does it for me. So there you go. That's, that's my honorable mentions. Cool. All right, Ken, the, the stack of doom. What do you got? Well, I'm surprised that nobody talked about any of these. This is 1974. Yes. Yes. <laughs> of course. King Crimson, Starless and Bottle Black. Yep, um, love it. I may like it better than red. I love red. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, not the best recording, but Emerson Lake and Palmer, Welcome Back, My Friends, yep. triple live album. I mean, that was the band at their peak. Recording is kind of, I think, kind of murky. Not and the they, best mix. They, they, they but, talk about yes songs and <laughs> the sound to that. Well, yes, song, yes songs is one of the worst recordings of a live album like ever. I mean, that's horrible. My yeah. only, my only qualm with that one is it's got cocaine tempos. <laughs> well, <laughs> what would you expect? I mean, of the time. I know, I know. <laughs> it is like like crazy chipmunks that you know. It, it, it's a little excessive. <laughs> um, here's PFM. Mm -hmm. We saw them in the end. Yeah, well, became yeah, the world. It's a album. It's a great album. Again, surprise nobody mentioned Renaissance, Turn of the yes, Cards. Turn of the Cards. Mm -hmm. I've let myself down with some of the stuff I've missed. I, I, I mean, I, Pete, I don't want to steal your thunder. I know well, you I, I don't need to do mine because you're you're going through all of them. So. Well, you, I know. Well, look, I, look, I'm going to steal this from you, Magna Contarcos. I know you're going to mention that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take this out of the plastic for you guys. Come on. Or, Horace Arnold, Tales of the Exonerated Fleet. Phenomenal album. I hope no, that, Pete, you know that you should talk more no. about that album. Oh, mm -hmm. Pete, you, you have to have this. It, yes. It's mm -hmm. basically a head on collision between Mahavishnu and, and Return to Forever. Yep. So, what so one John, John Abercrombie Sorry, Ken. What was doing his I best. Uh, John Sorry, Ken. I'm, 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 I'm huh? sure he does. It's a plug for, for me to place another order tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Nice. Strobes. Strobes. Her Her heroin. Heroin. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a, here's an oddball one. I love this album. I, I It would almost made my top five that I was going to talk about. Uh, Terry Ripdahl, Whenever I Seem to Be Far oh, Away. Oh, yeah. Nice. Great stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Beautiful album. Great Mellotron mm -hmm. on this album. And uh, here's a, a very obscure one, but I was involved in the reissue. Yatha Sidra, A Meditation Mass. Oh, I love that band. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Germany. <laughs> that, that was one of the most fun projects uh, I, I ever I ever worked on. Great, great German uh, kraut rock album. Um, I mean, I got a long list of stuff, but I mean, I, I can mention or you other guys can can mention I could go afterwards and uh, yeah. you want me to spout off some other things or to spout real quick. At least of us. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Dude, you're the you're the prog pusher. Come on, man. Well, we got Hatfield in the North, right? Yes. Right here. That was going to be one of mine. Self-titled. Yeah. Mag Magma Contarcos. Uh, Zappa, Roxy and Elsewhere. Was 73. I, I didn't pick that because I thought it was just studio, but yeah, obviously the Roxy is a well, uh, you know, 1974 release is 1974 release. Yeah, uh, Quella Vecchia Laconda, El Tempo della Gioia, mm -hmm. one of the great sort of PFM knockoffs. Ange, Adela du Delir, I thought was a great mm -hmm. French album. The best Piglietto album, Pigliato Pearly Inferno, 1974. Um, one that, a great record. one, one that kind of launched my business, um, very obscure, Eduardo Bort. From from Spain, that's that's how I launched. Uh, basically, the Lasers Edge label became the Lasers Edge label. Uh, Grobschnitt, Balanon, mm -hmm. uh, Dizion, Electric Silence, Release Music Orchestra, Life, uh, Klaus Schultz, Black Dance. Nice. And I know everybody's going to watch us later and they're gonna go, "Oh yeah, nobody talked about Release Music Orchestra." <laughs> but that's that, you know, the, and there's more. I mean, the list just oh, keeps going. A whole bunch. I'm sure you guys have other ones. <clears throat> yeah. Anthony, you got any? Yeah, you guys want to get drinking now? Uh -oh. yes. The Greatest Violin Soul Ever by Mr. Jobson. Uh, Roxy Music, Country Life, 1974. And Ken has stated, uh, my first Renaissance purchase. Uh, I love Black Flame. And of course, Mother mm. Russia is like Mother their Russia. epic yeah. tune of all mm. time. Nice. Cool. Mm. All right, Chuck. All right. 
Well, I have four. I had I had many more, but I was like, yeah, let me just narrow it down, just keep it simple. Because I knew that most of the albums that I had here was going to be picked by everyone else here. No one picked this album, Steely Dan's uh, Pretzel Logic. Mm. No. Um, what's that? Um, <clears throat> Electric Light Orchestra's um, El Dorado. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we, we've already mentioned um, <clears throat> um, this uh, Get Our Drinking Beer um, Ready. Um, Roxy Music's Country Life. <laughs> <laughs> and Gog's You. <laughs> so those are my those are my other four honorable picks right there. Cool. George, what do you got? Uh Just Miss for me was Camel Mirage. Nice. Uh, I also had the Horace E. Arnold, like Ken did. Mm -hmm. Couple I had that uh, no one said, uh, self titled from Energy, uh, Euro Fusion Band, Mahavishnu Vane. Good. And also the self titled from Mrs. Beasley. I don't know a whole lot about them actually, but uh, that's a real good record also. They're a good band. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. Lewis. Well, for me, I would like, we, we already mentioned um, Serious Traveler. Love it. Love this record. <laughs> Love this record. Um, Hatfield, of course, was another one. Mm -hmm. Debut. Um, I don't have it up here, but um, War Child, Jethro Tull, is mm -hmm. a record that a lot of people don't dig, but I love it. I absolutely love it. And um, even though it's not prog, it's proggy or prog-ish, it has enough interesting stuff in it that it qualifies for me, and that would be Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. Oh no! Uh, there's I some, love there's some prog on there, mm -hmm. and um, again, you know that is that is part of my musical DNA, every bit as much as as this one is, right? So I I, but I understand that that's people say, well, that's a metal band, man. So all right, fine. <laughs> but um, I, <laughs> I <laughs> <it's> <laughs> yeah, that's more addictive than heroin, right? Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, it, I I think I do think it it's interesting that everybody talked about red, but nobody met not one person mentioned Starless and Bible Black. Mm -hmm. so my album mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, yes, uh, I, mean, I love the it, album. It, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's that's like the record that always for me got overshadowed by this one. And you're absolutely right because mm -hmm. it's it's every bit as brilliant and and arguably it's equal, right? Mm -hmm. Or as you mm -hmm. even say, better. I I disagree with that, but that's just a matter of taste. It, it is a. a, a it's fucking King Crimson that era. Yeah. What more do you want, right? I, I agree with that. I think it gets lost in the shuffle between Larks and Red. Uh, mm -hmm. And Larks is two, you know, it's... Larks is just unbelievable. It's my yeah. number two of all time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my honorables mostly got mentioned. I mean, you know, we got Camel and Starless and Renaissance and Kansas and Return to Forever. Weather Report, uh, Todd Rundgren. Mm -hmm. The only one, uh, also War Child, I had as well. The only one that did, uh, that's in my honorables that did not get mentioned is uh, Hall the Mountain Grill by Oh Hawkwind. Nice. Oh man, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, the boy. only one. <laughs> Pete, did I ever mention I saw them on my honeymoon? Yes, you did. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> your, your poor wife. <laughs> Among like you know thirty other bands, I was like, man, I wanted to be on that honeymoon. Holy cow! Kane's honeymoon was the best festival that ever was. I'm telling you, it's like <laughs> didn't hang out his wife with his wife much, but he watched all these great bands. <laughs> cool now, right? I came home with seventy five albums. Wow. <laughs> she reminds me of that frequently. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so there we have it, everybody. Uh, 1974, a wonderful year for prog rock and fusion. As you've seen, so many great albums, and I'm sure there's plenty more that we didn't even mention, but uh, that's what you guys are for. So in the comments below, please list your favorite prog rock or j and jazz fusion uh, releases from 1974. And uh, I want to thank everybody here on the panel for a truly fun, fun episode here. This was, this was great. So uh, anybody got anything you want to plug before we let everybody go? Hmm. Lewis, what's new on the, uh, I know you. Uh, well, the, there is the, the tribute album to Norm, who's a Chicago guy who recently passed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, we're just waiting for the artwork. 
and I will get it out to you so you can give it a listen and maybe we can talk about it some more later. But um, that's what I have. Everything else is, it's we're working on it. So at this point, um, I'm working on some dates with Aziola Cry for for Fre February, I think, is, is where we're thinking about doing some shows. Aziola Cry is a great band on Ken's label. They're a Chicago band. Um, I highly recommend that you check them out. I, I, I heard them for the first time live many years ago, and they are phenomenal. So I'm very happy to be hitting the road with them next year. And um, that's it for me. Anybody interested in, in want to know what Aziola Cry are all about? Uh, I did a, a, sh a review here on the channel last week or the week before. So just look up the, uh, the under the uh, What's Hot playlist and look for the Aziola Cry episode. Really good album, really good band. So. If you want to hear it, you could hear it on on Lasers Edge Bandcamp, page lasersedge.bandcamp.com. Of course, it's on all platforms, Spotify, you know, Deezer, you name it. As you'll cries out there. Tommy Murray, the drummer, is a beast. So be, get ready. You Chicago guys, I got it going on out there, man. <laughs> <laughs> And what do you got? Uh, any uh, new stuff in stock that people should be aware of? That, Actually, uh, we just got the new uh, Dying Planet in. Jason Tipton from Zero Hour, his other ooh. his other band that just showed up today. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, just you know, we're you know we're always getting something, and we're just <laughs> we're starting to gear up to ship out the pre orders for the new Yes album. Uh, I will be announcing a, a signing of a new band, uh, sort of like an all star. Uh, prog metal uh, album that'll uh, we'll put it out early next year. Uh, so we'll be doing a formal announcement soon. The band is from Germany. They're called Philosophobia, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it because it sort of strikes me as that old school. I, well, I shouldn't call it old school, but that style of prog metal that I, that really kind of got me into doing metal. Uh, very melodic. But uh, lots of technicality, uh, great singing. So anyway, we'll be we'll be uh, we'll be sending out a press release on it soon, and we'll put that out early next year. We're going to be mastering it soon. Cool. Nice. Sounds good. Looking forward to that. Can I also mention Peter? Then I mean, it ties in with my number one. It is completely accidental, but the new issue of Fireworks Magazine, which I am part of the team on, has just come out with Roger Taylor on the cover. Nice. covering his new solo work uh, that came out just what's the day's date six days ago um to give it a nice plug it's got more album reviews than any other uk rock metal prog magazine out there you can get it from fireworks rock and metal just google that and that'll come up we've got a new web page for selling it and i went to see the wild hearts tonight and i have a four page interview with them in the magazine as well so if that floats your boat i mean there's Tons of other stuff. There's KK Downing, loads. I won't go into any great detail on it because it's not all prog related. But yeah, Roger Taylor's on the cover of the new one. Nice. And uh, we got some stuff coming up on the channel here uh, this week. You want to mention that a little bit? We do. We've got a couple of things. We've got a ranking the albums of um, power metal band, European power metal band, Dream Evil. Uh, not quite as Dio inspired as their name would suggest, but an excellent. A band with six albums, I think, to talk about. Quite difficult to rank because they're all really quite good. Uh, we're doing that with uh, Simon Bray, so that should be a good bit of fun because it always is when Simon's on. And we're also going to be doing an unboxing show, part of uh, what's hot with Sea of Tranquility. Uh, I've been lucky enough to get my hands on a whole lot of Uriah Heap. So there was a box, nice. uh, the 50 Years in Rock box came out a couple of months ago, I've got a copy of that. Uh, there's also a couple of, there's uh, Everyday Rocks, which is a completely different concept. It's got picture discs in it, and I haven't opened it because it's a proper unboxing that we're doing. I believe there's t-shirts in it and a variety of different things, so we'll see on that. And there's also, in the 50 Years Rocks, there was compilation albums chosen by members of the band from various eras. My bugbear with that was the only current member of the band that got to choose his songs was Mick Box, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. So they have rectified that. So we've got um, another couple, Bernie Shaw 
and I can't quite remember off the top of my head uh, who's chosen the other one, but we'll sort that out on the night that we do it. So we're doing that as well. An unboxing of all three of the Uriah Heap box sets that are out. There's an awful lot of Heap out there. Uh, so that should be fun. Have you guys heard Blind Gollum? Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you like it? I loved it. Yeah. And Steve, did, did you, you hear did that? a review. You did yeah. a review, right? I did. Yeah. 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 I think that's it a fun really album. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. It was that, that was Ken Hensley's last album, right? That he played on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they were doing dates with him on the road. Um, and he played a couple of solos on the album. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's... It's fun. Yeah, it's... it's you like Uriah like, Heap. Yeah. <laughs> they nail it. <clears throat> quite good. And the, the artwork is great. I think it's Roddy Matthews did the artwork for it. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's Beautiful. quite good. Yeah, good stuff. So as you can see, a lot of cool stuff coming up on the channel. And uh, I think uh, we've got a couple folks here that we need to get involved in album homework assignment shows. Uh, at some yes. point. <clears throat> the, th the three of you across the, I think, I think we're going to get Ken and Chuck and Anthony involved, though the other three have all participated in that so far. So uh, I will be contacting everybody uh, at some point to pair you up with someone to do, uh, to do that. I think that'll be a lot of fun. So stay tuned and uh <laughs> This is a web. What's that? You're gonna you're gonna hook me up with somebody who's gonna give me like a Burzum album or something. Like that. <laughs> and there's, there's also oh, a won't that be the fun? Huh? Well. <laughs> there's also gonna yeah, be a rematch. Get Feigenbaum well, involved. Get yeah. Feigenbaum a death metal album. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, oh, yeah, be exactly. fantastic. It'd be great. I'll give Laszlo the the bad things he wanted to hear. As yeah. only Feigenbaum can deliver. Uh -oh. <laughs> somebody's gonna give me the first Oliver album or something you know? yeah, we'll, 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 we'll hook you up with Nick Franco we'll be sure to get you something <laughs> that's, wonderful. You that's wonderful that's great okay. and there's, there's also a rematch coming as well Peter Yes, uh -oh. we, we do have a rematch coming. So Stephen and Simon Bray are going to be going at it once again uh, in October, in early October. So that is coming up. So who are the matches we've got? So we've got Rich Catino going up against uh, Jamie Laszlo on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, the following week is Jim Baki and um, uh, Lynn Versace. Wow. And I think oh, we wow. got you two oh. guys. I'm trying oh. to look at the this. So then we got Simon and Stephen once again. And then I got to kind of figure it out from there. So, uh, but I have, I have, it's weird because we're only doing the show once a week and I've got all these matchups I want to get to and everybody wants to take part in it. So I, I may, I may at some point make this a twice a week show because it's just, it's so much fun and just people are so into it and uh, the viewers love it. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see. I'll give one spoiler about the rematch and that is it will come with one of those stickers, not one of those stickers that I love to keep on the front of an album. But a parental guidance sticker. That's all I'm going really? to say. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, well, right. It's, it's going to be a Prince album. It's going to be a Prince album. Well, the life is with a tipper sticker. Oh, wow. All righty. Well, as as most in most cases, I don't like to know what they have chosen for each other. So I'm I'm really intrigued. And when when we did the last show with you guys, I was kind of like, wow. It's like you, I'd never heard either album. One band I remember hearing of. The other one, I was like, no clue. But uh, that was a fantastic episode. So all right, I'm looking forward to this now. Very cool. All right. Very cool. So there you go. There you have it, everybody. Lots to look forward to. Uh, in the meantime, put your favorite albums from 1974, Prague and Fusion albums down below, and uh, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on this thing called YouTube. All oh, 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 yeah. uh, for Stephen Reed, Ken Golden, our Center Square Anthony Ferraro, Chuck Alvarez, George Lemmy, and Louis Nasser, I and Pete Pardo. Good night, everybody. See you next Tuesday. Bye bye. Good night, everyone.